Hello and welcome everyone. Today's Cybers Focus Forum is on, um, a, it's a, the first part of a two-part webinar on nanopore sequence data analysis in the Cybers discovery environment presented by Upendra Devasetti. I'm Tina Lee, Cybers' user engagement officer. Uh, the second part will be presented in two weeks on May 3rd by Jawan Song of the Texas Advanced Computing Center, one of our Cybers uh, partners. For those unfamiliar with Cybers, we are an NSF-funded cyber infrastructure project, and this webinar series helps fulfill part of our mission to train the next generation of scientists on how to use the computational resources that we have developed. Uh, here's a fun fact that I'm very proud of. Some of the data analysis used to make the first photo of the black hole that was announced just last week was done here on Cybers. So it just goes to show what can happen when you do use Cybers. Okay, let's take care of some housekeeping really quickly and then on to the webinar. Today's presentation is a little bit long, a little bit more than 30 minutes, and we'll have time for Q&A at the end. Please uh, open the chat window and type your questions there for Upendra. We'll address those at the end. Materials from today's webinar, such as the presentation slides and the video of this webinar, will be posted on a wiki page and we'll send you the link for that later today. I also wanted to tell you about an upcoming training that Cybers is offering called Foundational Open Science Skills, or FOSS. It's a camp-style event from June 3rd through 14th here at the University of Arizona, um, and we'll include the link for that at the end of the webinar. Um, let's see, also our last webinar of this spring series will be on May 17th on how to scan and visualize genomes with PatMatch and Circos in Cybers Vice. That will be presented by Wayne Decatur of SUNY's Upstate Medical College. Uh, please visit our website events page for more information and to register for both part two of the nanopore sequencing webinar and for Wayne's webinar. Last, we are in the process of scheduling fall webinars, so please feel free to email me um, with any comments or suggestions for topics you'd like to see, and we'll do our best to try and cover those. Without further ado, uh, please meet Upendra Devasetti, who not only builds Cybers uh, tools and apps using the latest container technology, but whose expertise is in next, next generation sequencing and RNA sequencing. Hello, Upendra. Thank you, Tina, for the wonderful introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, depending on the time zone you're currently in. I'm very excited to kickstart this Nanopore data analysis webinar series in Cybers. The first part being running NanoDZ in Vice Cybers. Let's get started. Today's Focus Forum webinar covers the following topics. I'll start by introducing MinION and MinION sequencing. And then I'll talk a little bit about the bioinformatic data analysis and the different pipelines available out there. And then I'll introduce NanoDZ, which is the main component of today's webinar, followed by Vice, which is also the uh, other important component of today's webinar. And finally, I'll show you a short demo of how to run NanoDZ in CybersWise. Okay, so before I actually start uh, introducing the MinION data and the NanoDZ, let me tell you what this webinar doesn't cover. This webinar doesn't cover the MinION sample and library preparations, nor sequencing chemistry of the nanopore nor troubleshooting library and sequencing runs. At Cybers, we don't do any wet lab uh, experiments, so we don't have enough expertise to cover these particular topics. But if you are interested in any of these topics, feel free to uh, express your interest in the chat or email one of four, and then we'll try to find a speaker who is expert in these areas, and then we'll try to do a follow-up webinar or a video on this. And finally, this particular webinar doesn't cover the in-depth analysis of MinION applications, such as de novo assembly, variant calling, or metagenomics. Javon from Texas Advanced Computing Center will cover a few of these topics in the second part of the webinar in two weeks from now. Okay, so let's get started by introducing uh, what is MinION sequencer. MinION sequencer is a USB sized uh, sequencer, which I'm holding it in my hand, which has the capacity to sequence up to 10 GB of sequence data in real time. 
the time taken to actually go from sample to sequence is significantly lower compared to other technologies such as Illumino and uh, PacBio. Because this is because the steps that are required to uh, prepare a library is significantly shorter compared to other technologies. I'm not going to go into the details of uh, the anatomy of the sequencer, but basically it consists of two components, uh, the base, which is connected to a personal computer or a laptop, or a flow, and a flow cell that where you add your um, sample. Okay, again, I'm not going to go into the details of mean ion sequencing, but basically mean ion identifies uh, the sequence when the DNA is passed through the nanopores, which are incorporated uh, onto a membrane that is statistically charged. Uh, whenever this DNA passes, it uh, changes the current, which is uh, represented in the form of squiggles, which you are seeing in the animation on the far right. And this squiggles is a starting point of all the mean ion data analysis, which we will talk in detail in the next 30 minutes. Okay, so the, the data formats uh, that you are expected to see from mean ion data uh, can be uh, classified into three different types. Uh, the first and the most important is the FOSH file format, which is very popular and which is proprietary to uh, nanopore data. So the raw data that, you, that gets generated from mean ion sequencer gets stored as binary in HDF5, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, briefly called or shortly called as FOSH file format. And uh, similar to other binary formats such as BAM or CRAM, uh, you can't easily visualize these phosphor files, but there are tools such as HDF5 uh, view and uh, other HFL uh, view uh, tools that you can use to visualize this phosphor. And if you have time uh, in my presentation, I can actually show you how you can actually uh, visualize this. And the next uh, important data format is the FOSHQ format, which most of you are familiar. And so I'm not going to go into the details, but basically each read, uh, whether it's an Illumina or uh, mean ion, basically consists of four lines. The first line starts with an ad and then uh, some information about the sequence uh, machine and so on. The second line consists of the actual sequence. And the third line, just starts with plus and optionally sometimes you see uh, additional uh, information in there. And the fourth line is, uh, is one of the important uh, components of FOSTQ file. Basically it shows you the quality of each of the nuclear types corresponding to, uh, corresponding to the nuclear types in line two. Okay, so the bioinformatic uh, analysis that can be performed using main ion sequencer can be broadly classified into uh, three different types. The first one uh, is the de novo genome assembly, where basically you take your raw data and you run a base color, uh, um, and then you run a de novo assembler, followed by reference alignment and annotation. The, in the second bioinformatics pipeline, uh, you do a variant calling. This is uh, provided that you have a reference genome that you, that you already have. Uh, again, the initial pipeline is you take your raw data, you do a base calling, and then you map it to the reference, and then you do annotation and gene analysis. Metagenomics bioinformatics pipeline is slightly different from the other two. Uh, there are some common aspects, such as you take your raw data, you do a base calling, and then you generate a de novo assembly. Before you generate a de novo assembly, you filter the reads based on the quality using the tools, uh, and then you classify the reads uh, based on uh, tools such as centrifuge, and then you assemble using mini -asm and mini map, and finally uh, you use uh, assemblers such as Kanu and uh, classify using um, common tools such as Flash. We'll go a little bit in detail about this uh, in my uh, hands-on demo. Okay, so irrespective of the bioinformatics tools uh, that you saw earlier, um, there are common steps that are needed, which we already went um, uh, in short before. Uh, the first one is the base calling. So base calling is the process of converting the raw data in fast file format into FOSHQ format. And once you have the FOSHQ format, it's always recommended or best practice to check the quality of the assembly uh, and this is where you do data quality assessment. 
And, and in the third step, uh, based on the quality, before you do a genome assembly of weighted calling or metagenome uh, uh, pipeline, then it's always uh, good to uh, trim the reads if you think the quality is not good. And uh, sometimes if you uh, combine more than one sample and sequence, uh, you actually need to demultiplex them, uh, which, is, uh, which is a process of separating uh, uh, individual samples based on the barcode. And so once you perform all these steps, then you can uh, do your actual bioinformatic uh, analysis, such as uh, de novo assembly, polishing the assembly, followed by genome annotation, or evident calling of uh, metagenomics. Okay, so if you look at the different steps in bioinformatics pipelines that um, I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of tools that are involved at each step and each bioinformatic analysis. So would it, be, it would be good if there's a platform or an environment that can help you process all these, uh, all these steps uh, in a uh, automated and in reproducible and interactive way. This is where NanoDJ Nano comes into the picture. So NanoDZ is a dockerized collection of Jupyter notebooks for doing interactive and reproducible mean ion data analysis. We'll know more about this uh, in the next few slides, but basically it consists of all the steps that are needed for doing base calling, retraining, refiltering, quality control. And it also has uh, tools to simulate the reads. So if you don't have fast five files, but you still want to play with uh, NanoDZ, then um, there's, uh, there are, NanoDZ provides tools to generate these fast five files, uh, along with the uh, ability of uh, widely used LNS and assemblers such as Kano, Minias, Minimap, uh, Fly, and so on. So NanoDZ is built as a Docker container. So if you don't know about Docker, don't worry. So this is a package uh, mechanism that uh, packages not only your source code, but also the dependencies so that you can uh, uh, ship it and then you can run it reproducibly. And it runs as a Jupyter Lab instance. Again, uh, if you're not used to uh, use uh, Jupyter Notebook for your research, don't worry, you'll know more about this uh, when I show you a short demo of it. Okay, so this is a schematic diagram of what NanoDZ can do for you. So NanoDZ covers most of the mean ion data analysis um, workflow and it divides them into three different components. Uh, the first one is the base calling and simulations. And the second component is summary quality control and filtering. And the third and the most important component is the genome assembly and comparisons. We will look at some of this uh, in detail in the short hand, in the uh, hands-on demo. Okay, so this table basically shows you uh, the different notebooks that are available in NanoDZ and uh, what they can do at each step of MinION data analysis. For example, 1.0 base calling dot IPM and B notebook basically uh, does base calling. Again, just to reiterate, base calling is the process of converting the events or raw electrical sig signals from a MinION sequencer to FASTQ or FASTIA file. And then there are other um, Jupyter notebooks for trimming. Uh, there are Jupyter notebooks that uh, do the uh, de novo assembly or hybrid assembly. Or you can also compare the different um, um, uh, different assemblers using quast uh, and so on. And finally, they provided a, uh, a Jupyter notebook that does end-to-end -end analysis. Um, they have provided that. Uh, they have. Uh, they have a uh, metagenomics use case as an example to do that. Okay, so let's quickly switch gears and talk a little bit about VICE because this is also a different, uh, this is also an important component of today's webinar. So VICE stands for Visual Interactive Computing Environment, uh, which is an extension of Cyber's Discover Environment, which allows users to launch web applications packaged into Docker in Discovery Environment. Unlike other uh, cyber applications, WISE allows users to access these apps through a secure and authenticated URLs uh, as shown in the picture on the right. And if you want to know more about WISE, I provided a URL and, uh, and also I provided a URL of, a, of the Focus Forum webinar that we done a couple of months ago. 
Okay, so so how nano DJ, uh, how wise help to run nano DJ? Well, nano DJ currently runs as Docker container or as a binder. Again, don't worry if you don't know about binder. So binder is a way of making Jupyter notebooks interactive. Unfortunately, both the both these processes are not suitable if you have a big data set because big data sets uh, require um, high memory to run the uh, analysis. In addition to uh, uh, in addition to the memory requirements, Vice also um, allows reproducibility, security, shareability, running, uh, ease of running, etc. We'll see some of these features in the hands-on demo. And Vice also takes care of moving the data in and out of uh, NanoDC in a streamlined and secure manner, uh, which you'll see shortly. This is one of the most important component of running any interactive analysis, uh, any analysis in general. Like, uh, it's, it's always a good idea to bring the computation to the data rather than data to the computation. And finally, Vice support powerful data analysis in an automated uh, uh, manner. Okay, so let me quickly uh, show you a short demo of how you can run Nano DJ in Vice. So I have provided a quick start tutorial in here. So let me uh, click this link. Okay, so this quick start basically shows you how to run Nano DJ Vice app in DE. Uh, basically, it tells you all the prerequisites, uh, the only prerequisites for running Vice app in DE, uh, Nano DJ Vice app in DE is uh, a Cyrus account. And, uh, and, and, and I also provided what are the input and example data, which you don't have to remember because I'm gonna show it shortly. And then I also showed uh, how you can launch uh, Nano DJ. Uh, so here are some of the instructions. Basically you log into Discover Environment and you click on apps window and then, um, and then you launch the app. So, uh, we have also provided this uh, launch device button that basically automates this process. So let's quickly go ahead and click this launch device button. So if you're not logged into Discover Environment, then it will ask you to log in since I already logged in, uh, basically. So it did not ask me to uh, uh, log in again. So as I mentioned uh, in my uh, quick start that once you launch your, once you click that uh, Nano DJ Vice uh, app, it, it, this will bring you a Nano DJ Vice app, which you're seeing right now. And if you look at the documentation, the only requirements to run this Nano DJ Vice app is uh, an input file, which is basically a script that, basically, that helps you to run the data. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on the plus button, plus add button that basically takes me to the location of uh, the input file. So here you're seeing some uh, folders. Uh, don't worry about the first two folders. So the only file that we are interested in right now is the data underscore transfer dot sh file. So I'm click here and then I'll say okay and then I'll say launch analysis. Okay, so uh, if you are not a Cybers uh, discovery uh, environment user, um, so what you expect to see is uh, three notifications for each job. Uh, so the first notification uh, is, uh, says that the job has been submitted. And the second notification says that if you want to access your running analysis, click this link. So I'm gonna go ahead and click this link, uh, which opens the Vice app in a separate uh, tab. Okay. So this is a Jupyter Nano DJ Vice app uh, running in your browser. Again, uh, sometimes it will ask you to authenticate. Uh, you, since you already logged in, it did not uh, ask me to do it. Okay, so I'll go into the details of the Jupyter Lab interface in a minute, but basically, We'll start downloading the data and then we will discuss uh, what, this, uh, what this interface is if you are not a uh, JupyterLab user. So I'll go ahead and click this terminal and then navigate to uh, Vice. Okay, let me make this a little big. Navigate to the Vice directory and then if you uh, list the contents, uh, you'll see a uh, script called data underscore transfer dot sh. 
So let me look at, let me show the contents of the data underscore transfer.sh. So it only cont contains two lines. The first line is a line to, uh, line to uh, give permission to the data on the data store. And the second line basically tells you to download the test data onto the uh, NanoD device app. So let me quickly uh, do that. Let me enter my password, Cybers password. And then if your Cybers password is correct, then it will start downloading the data. While it is doing, let me quickly show you uh, the different components of the Jupyter Lab interface. Okay, let me see what the different. Okay, so these are all the questions that we can address at the end of this webinar. Okay, so if you're not a Jupyter Lab uh, users, you're missing so much because Jupyter Lab interface um, is, is, is one of the most popular interfaces for doing interactive and reproducible data analysis. It is, it is already quite popular in data science, but it's also getting popular in bioinformatics and other area of research as well. So the Jupyter Lab interface is an uh, interactive environment that can be divided into two different panes. Well, the, the pane on the left is a file browser and the pane on the right is a dashboard that basically consists of notebooks, consoles, and others. You can customize this whatever way you want uh, by changing the code. Right now, uh, we have four different kinds of notebooks and consoles, uh, Python 3 notebook, Bash notebook, Julian notebook, and R notebook, and so on. And in the other section of the Jupyter Lab, we have terminal, which we just uh, tried. And then we also have a text editor. So if you want to write your script, then you can use one of these. On the left, what you're seeing here are the different uh, folders. And it, in each of these folders differs from application to application. So this uh, folder structure is specific to NanoDJ app. Okay, so the most important uh, folder we are uh, interested in for this particular hands-on demo is the WISE folder. So if I click on this WISE folder, what you'll see here is the logs folder, which is uh, specific to Cybers Discover environment. And then the data transfer.asset script, we, this is the same script that we just uh, looked at it. And this is the same script that we use to uh, transfer the data as well. Okay, and this uh, nano DJ underscore webinar underscore demo is the folder that basically consists of Jupyter notebooks along with the test data. And uh, since this is still downloading, so what I'll do is I'll go ahead and show you a Jupyter notebook, Jupyter lab um, uh, instance that I launched a little earlier because, uh, because I don't want to wait while the data is being transferred. I mean, it won't take that much time to transfer this data because uh, we are using AI commands which uses multi-threading to transfer the data from data store to the Jupyter notebook in quick time. But still, uh, in the interest of time, we are not going to go. Uh, we are not going to wait until the data is downloaded. But as you can see here, the Jupyter Lab instance that I launched earlier basically uh, is the same as uh, we just launched. And it basically consists of this WISE folder that we looked at it. And the only difference is when I click this uh, nanodj underscore webinar underscore demo, now you'll see the data folder along with the Jupyter notebooks. Let me stress this a little bit. Uh, the Jupyter notebooks along with the other um, files. Okay, so to get started, I'll open this, uh, uh, the PNG, just to uh, give you a context. So this is the same uh, schematic diagram that you saw a little earlier in my presentation that basically tells you what all nanodes can do. Like for example, it can do base calling, it can do quality control, it can do genome assembly and so on. So let's quickly start with the first Jupyter notebook. So the first Jupyter notebook I have it here is the base calling. Again, uh, if you have not used Jupyter Notebook before, uh, this is the first time. So Jupyter Notebook is an interactive notebook that uh, allows you to uh, write text in Markdown. And also you can put your code and execute it. And you can also uh, see 
uh, pictures in, embedded in it. So this notebook doesn't have any pictures, but if I open this notebook, then you can actually see uh, the pictures uh, embedded into the notebook. So this is a good way of doing your analysis, not only interactively, but also reproducibly, but also, and also uh, it's good for teaching because the students will actually see the code along with the output. Uh, if there's any figures, they'll see that as well. So anyway, so let's quickly uh, take a look at the first Jupyter notebook, uh, which is the base calling. And again, uh, as you learned earlier, base calling is the process of converting the uh, electrical signals, uh, also called events, into uh, fast Q format or fast IA format. And for this, uh, NanoDJ uses Albacore, which is the official base caller for uh, Oxford Nanopore data at the time of uh, this notebook. So, I mean, if you are already a command line user, the first thing that you'll do after installing the package is to look to see how this package is being used. And this particular command is no exception. Uh, this basically tells you the tells you uh, the different options that are available for Albacore. So in order to execute this particular cell, uh, you can either use uh, command uh, shift and enter, or you can use this run button. So let me quickly go ahead and run this particular cell. Once you run this particular cell, depending on the command you have in the cell, it basically displays the, uh, the standard out, which you are used to see when you're running it on the terminal. And this, this is a usage for uh, Albacore base caller and which basically tells you what the inputs and what the outputs and so on. And the most important uh, component of base caller is not uh, in addition to the input files, uh, input directories where you have the fast file files and then the threads, uh, you, al you also have to specify the configuration file. So how do, you, how do you know what configuration file you need? Well, uh, there's a command uh, called uh, read underscore fast file underscore base caller dash L that basically shows you uh, the, it basically shows you the table uh, that has flow cell, kit, barcoding, and then the config file. Depending on the flow cell that you use, depending on the kit that you use, you can select a config file. Uh, as shown in this example. So this is a fully assembled uh, exa example for base calling that, that shows where the, where the uh, fast file files are located, uh, how many threads you need, or what the output, uh, where the output directory is going, and what the output type, in this case, FastQ, and you can also use FastA, uh, and also the config files that you just found out from here. I'm not going to go, and run this because it takes uh, at least a minute and we don't want to wait that long. I already run this before, so if I click this, then the three dots, that basically shows that this took like 49 uh, seconds to do that. So let me quickly show you where that output is. So if you look at the output, so it says data slash sample slash albacore output. So I'll click data on this. Uh, slash um, samples slash albacore output. And then, so the next step of, uh, uh, after running the albacore or base calling is to combine the reads that are deposited into two different directories, pass and fail. Uh, even though those directories are put into two separate folders and indicating whether they pass the quality control or pass the fail, fail, fail uh, and fail the quality control, we normally take those two reads and do a further quality control on that. So uh, if I open this file, then you'll see those two files. And if I open this, uh, you'll find one file called fastq. Uh, fastq file, again, um, uh, if you are doing like bioinformatics or if you are in the sequencing uh, research for a long term, you are used to seeing this. The only difference is this is um, uh, longer compared to the Illumina FastQ files. Okay, so once you have the FastQ files, let me quickly navigate to my original um, directory and then open the quality control. 
uh, Jupyter Notebooks, uh, the quality control is a process of uh, checking the quality of the PostQ files before you subject them to de novo assembly of it and calling a meta genome and so on. For this, NanoDZ uses custom scripts and, and they use a BioPython module, uh, which, uh, which is shown in this. Uh, the first cell basically uh, shows the different uh, components that are needed to import uh, the libraries uh, which are needed for. Uh, for converting the first Q file into a data frame. Okay, and this cell basically has a uh, custom function that basically converts first Q file to first IA. And if you uh, execute this, basically this shows you uh, how the data frame looks like. Basically, it consists of three uh, columns read length, GC content, and average quality. Now you can use uh, um, Python packages such as matplotlib and uh, cborn to actually plot this uh, histogram. So this particular uh, figure basically shows the read length histogram that shows the quality of each of those um, uh, uh, reads in base space and then how many of those reads have the quality. And then you can do the same thing for GC content. I already ran this, so you can actually just uh, click on these three dots and then you can uh, see that. And then you can also do um, average quality histogram and so on. And you can also divide them based on uh, a, a particular criteria. So in this example, I'm showing them like, uh, separate them based, in, based on a particular criteria, like for example, average quality, uh, of more than uh, a GC content of more than 30 and less than 50. And then the second category basically consists of GC content uh, 55 and less than 80 and so on. Okay, so if you're not a Python person and if you're not uh, uh, have written Python code before, then uh, and then then there's a tool called MinION QC that which is an R script. Uh, again, uh, you don't have to write any script. Um, basically, this is, this is a uh, written script that actually accepts the, uh, the summary file that is generated from the ALBA core and then generates, uh, uh, gen generates plots. So let me quickly take, you know, show you how the output looks like from this. So if you look at this, if you look at this, uh, the input for MENA and QC is the uh, ALBA core Albuco underscore output, uh, the sequence underscore summary dot text in the Albuco underscore output. So let me quickly show you that Albuco output. Yeah, so one of this file is a summary file. So let me, yeah, so sequence summary dot text. So this is an input for uh, the mean ion QC. And, uh, and after you run the mean ion QC, it generates these uh, plots. And if you uh, open one of these files, this is basically, uh, this is a yield um, uh, file that is generated from mean ion QC. Okay, so let's move ahead and take a look at the other Other Jupyter notebooks. So let's start with um, adapter trimming. Uh, so it's always a good idea to check for the adapters and then remove them or trim them um, if needed. And also, if you have a sample uh, that is barcoded and multiplexed, then you need to demultiplex them. And both of these tasks can be done using Pochop. Pochop is also uh, one of the popular tools for uh, nanopore. And, um, MinION uh, data that helps to find the adapters, train them, and if the adapters are in the middle of the sequence, it splits the read into two different uh, parts. Again, if you want to know more about Nanopore or Pochop, then you can execute this uh, cell that basically shows you the help function for Pochop. And then if I scroll down, then here is a here is a cell that basically shows how to actually run um, uh, Pochop on a data set. For this particular data set, we are downloading it uh, from a public repository and then multiplexing them. Once you <clears throat> demultiplex them and once you trim all the adapters, then you can use uh, 
uh, custom packages such as matplotlib and uh, biopython to generate figures such as this so this figure basically shows you the yield uh, per barcode and the average length of each of those reads okay again i'm not going to go into the details but uh, after uh, demultiplexing you can also uh, use the custom scripts to check the quality of each of those demultiplex libraries okay okay so the next is the most important uh, which is a dino assembly that many of us are interested so once you uh, do a barcode or uh, do a base calling and then check the quality and then demultiplex if needed or trim the read or trim the adapters uh, if you have any then you can use uh, Kanu assembler to actually do a de novo assembly and Kanu is a very popular assembler so it is a fork of celery assemblers if you are used to uh, pack bio uh, or the uh, long read assemblers and um, and one of the uh, limitations of Kanu uh, is it's very high memory uh, to run to uh, assemble a genome. And if it is a small genome, then you can run it right here. But if you have a big genome, then we highly encourage not to run it in Jupyter Notebook. And Javan will show you how to do that on a separate kind of apps in two weeks from now. Again, once you run the, so if you want to know uh, more about Kanu, then you can run this uh, particular cell. And then uh, again, I'm not gonna run this because it's gonna take a long time. And, but I can actually show you the output uh, that is expected uh, after running the Kanu. So it's, uh, Kanu, it's run, Kanu uh, shows a bunch of uh, stats that are displayed in the Jupyter Notebooks. These are all very important if you are actually doing some interactive analysis, trying to optimize parameters and so on. And you can also capture them into a file and then take a look at it uh, later on. So once everything uh, works, then basically it tells you, uh, let me quickly. This is a long uh, output. So basically it tells you that the assembly is finished and then uh, you can take a look at the assembly in this particular folder. And then it also saves the, uh, the, the summary in, in this file called sample.report, which is available in the same particular directory, Kono underscore output. And once you uh, run your Kono assembler, which is good for, um, uh, for nanopore data because nanopore data is mostly error prone, then you can use this RECON, which is a consensus module to correct the raw context generated from uh, Kono or some other assemblers. And after you run Recon, then you can use Pylon. Pylon is a tool to, uh, that uses the short reads to collect long reads. And so the only limitation for Pylon is you need to have short reads from the same species or close related species uh, that you're trying to assemble. Okay, so I also have a Jupyter notebook that uh, does the genome assembly, but with a different assembler, Fly. And this is a straightforward assembler, but still it is uh, memory intensive. So make sure that you have enough memory to run this particular step. Okay, so it, it's always a good idea to uh, try different assemblers. And one of those types of assemblers is called hybrid assemblers. Hybrid assemblers uh, uh, uses uh, the two different kinds of technology, Oxford, Nanopore, and then Illumina. To make, a, um, to make a combined assembly. Because as you all know, uh, um, Oxford Nanopore uh, uh, reads are, have like more error compared to uh, the Illumina reads. So it's always a good idea to use the Illumina reads to correct uh, long reads uh, that are generated from Oxford Nanopore technologies. And uh, NanoDJ provides two types of hybrid assemblers, Unicycler and uh, Masuka. Again, uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but you can see if you actually look at the Jupyter Notebook, it explains everything like uh, how to run it and where to find the test data and so on and so on. Okay, so after you uh, run your assembly using however number of assemblers, whether it's de novo assemblers using Kanu or Fly or the hybrid assembler using Unicycler and uh, Masuka, it's always a good idea to uh, compare the different assemblers to select a particular assembly 
to do downstream analysis, such as like annotation or uh, uh, or mapping and so on. So in the, at this uh, uh, for this particular um, use case, then you can use Quast. So Quast is a very popular tool to check the quality of your assembly. So the only requirement for Quast is you need to provide the parts to uh, the two different kinds of assemblers. And then, uh, uh, and after running the quest, you'll get a report that basically shows the comparison of the two different kinds of uh, assemblers uh, with respect to con number of contexts, total length, N50, and so on. Like, depending on uh, these different assembly features, then you can select a particular uh, assembly and then use that for downstream analysis. Okay, finally. There's a Jupyter notebook uh, for alignment with BWA, Rebler, or Blast. So this this uh, assumes that you already have an assembly way which you can use to map the reads against. So for this uh, particular Jupyter notebook, they use BWA, which is still popular for mapping long reads uh, to uh, mapping the uh, long reads to the assembly, and then. You also have Rebler and then the Blast as well. Again, uh, all the information the, uh, that is needed to run this LNLs is provided here. Okay, so finally, uh, there is a Jupyter notebook that basically shows end-to-end -end analysis. Uh, for example, um, you have some test data and you want to run the, all the steps uh, in one notebook. Yeah, either you can do that in individual notebooks or you can have one notebook to do that. And here is an example of, uh, of, a, of a particular notebook that does uh, metagenomics uh, analysis. Basically, this notebook basically uh, starts with mean ion sequencing. This is the same um, introduction that I had a little earlier. And then it has this color that basically shows you uh, how to convert uh, raw data into FASTQ files. And then again, I'm not going to show how um, uh, to run it because it takes uh, some time, like one minute, and we don't want to wait that long. Um, so, and after you run the base caller, so you combine the first few files that are generated uh, from uh, generated from running the base caller. And then this is small information about uh, uh, first few file, and then you use the bio Python module to convert fastq file into fastia file uh, and then use the different libraries available for bios bio python as well as python libraries such as numpy and pandas to actually convert uh, fastq file into a data frame which you can use for visualization uh, as shown in this example and once you uh, look at the quality and then if you think the quality is bad then you can filter them or you can trim them uh, uh, using photoshop and so on and uh, coming back to the metagenomics use case once you have gone through the process of uh, base calling and quality control uh, then you can um, then you can use those uh, reads for doing some metagenomics uh, analysis so the, the four steps that are needed for metagenomics uh, analysis is like you create a database from the reference that you're interested in. So this assumes that you already have a reference genome that you can use to map the reads against. And then they use the BLAST because this is very uh, popular and easy to actually classify the reads into different uh, taxa. And then you use Python for filtering uh, and you can also use other tools such as Nanofill to filtering the uh, uh, filtering the different components and then you plot the results uh, again like here is a step to uh, index your uh, uh, reference genome and here is a uh, here is a step to blast those reads against the uh, reference genome and then here is a uh, here is a cell that basically shows you to convert uh, the uh, the, the blast output to a file something like this which you can use for visualization such as this 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 um, I chart basically shows you uh, the classification of the of the different reads according to how they map on the reference genome and you can also do a bar, bar plot like this okay so these are all the different uh, notebooks that are available for doing mean ion uh, data analysis um, so you might be wondering like how what if, if a particular tool is not uh, available in this Jupyter notebook that I'm interested in 
for, for that particular uh, use case, what you can do is uh, you can use uh, Conda Package Manager to install a particular package. For example, um, just search for like Conda, search C Bio Conda, and then you search for Nanofilt. So the Nanofilt is a, uh, is a tool that helps you to filter the reads based on particular quality so sometimes you you don't want to trim the reads but you just want to check the average quality of the read and if that average quality doesn't pass a particular threshold then you want to throw that read away and you only want to keep a particular uh, read that passes a, uh, a particular quality so now it shows that uh, nanofield has several versions of that so if you just type nano Conda install C Bioconda. So it's C Bioconda dash C Bioconda is necessary, which says that try, hey, Conda try to search for this package in a Bioconda channel and not other channels. And then you say Nanofield. You can also specify a particular version. If you don't worry about particular version, you just want the latest version, then you just, um, you just leave it without any. <coughs> Uh, version number okay so we're not gonna go and wait for this particular thing uh, let it uh, install so once you fish, finish your analysis what do you do so right now as you can see here if i come here in the data and then if i click on the sample i generated so much output data and i don't want to download this onto my computer so one thing you can do is you can transfer this manually into your data store or uh, you can let uh, discovery environment do do it for you for example so this is an so this is the analysis that we launched for the for the webinar i also i also have a, a nano dj running for this particular use case here so what you can do is you can click this particular uh, analysis that you're interested in uh, and then you go to the analysis folder and then when you say complete and save output, what it does, it, it freezes the, uh, the session that you're running in and brings in all the outputs that are generated from this into your analysis folder. I'm not gonna go do that right now, but basically that, that's how you do it. The other way is, this is a lost um, uh, aspect in this uh, hands-on demo. The other thing is what you can do, you, you can use the I comments like I put. So for example, uh, let's go to CD Vice and then Nano, Nano DJ webinar demo and then sample data sample output. Okay, so if you do a list of, of this directory, you see so many files. Now I want to move uh, Albuquerque output. So what I can do is use uh, I put command and then say I put dash R PVT, uh, which is the flags that are optional. You don't have to worry about that. And then you say Albuquerque. And once I press this, then this will transfer the Albuco output and puts it into my home directory. So let me quickly show you. So I'll go and open my um, data window. So let me start from the beginning. So, so I click on the data window and then I click on my personal folder and then uh, somewhere here you'll see I have so much data. Yeah, so you can see that uh, Albuco output has been transferred back to my um, personal uh, space in the data store. Okay, so let me switch back to my presentation and then see what I have for the, uh, what I have. Okay, so, so there are a few things that to keep in mind uh, while using NanoDZ or Cygos in general. So the NanoDZ has not been tested on on your sequencing data or Prometheon or grid ion data. Uh, so if you are interested in any kind of data, then we can give it a try and then if you have any questions, then we can answer them. You can also try at your, at your end. And NanoDZ is, is not a substitute to other data 
analysis pipelines that you are aware or you have been using. So NanoDZ is a nice way of interactive data analysis before you can run a big analysis that we will show in the next part of the webinar. So most importantly, avoid running base calling and assembly stuffs in notebooks and bias. Um, coming to the point of like memory requirements, which are huge for base calling and assembly. It's, so it's not a good practice to running this kind of memory intensive jobs in, uh, in web browsers. So there's another way to do that, which we will uh, talk, about, uh, talk about those in two weeks. And unfortunately, no pseudo privileges are available for users in Jupyter Notebook. So if there's any, if there's any Linux dependencies that are missing, unfortunately, there's no way we can install those dependencies. However, if you are interested in installing a package like Nanofilp that we saw earlier, then you can use a Conda Package Manager to install because Conda doesn't need uh, pseudo permission. Okay, so um, before I wrap up, I just want to list out uh, some of the useful references that you might find useful for uh, your particular data analysis. Uh, for example, if you want to know more about WISE, I provided the link. And I also provided the link of a training course on uh, main ion data that basically goes through each and every step, uh, but they don't provide a way to run it. So what you can do you, is use that uh, data set and training course and run it in analytics and then see how you can actually combine those two uh, things into one place. And if you're uh, interested in looking at the other tools that are available for Nanofor or MinION in general, then uh, I provided the link. Uh, those are all the GitHub repositories. And most importantly, uh, I highly encourage you to attend the second part of this Nanofor webinar where we will be more specific, like uh, if you are interested in uh, genome assembly or if you're interested in variant calling, then how do you do that? Uh, then we will show a different way of doing that. But this, the concepts that you learn from this webinar are still useful for the second part as well. And finally, I just want to give a shout out uh, to uh, two weeks uh, workshop that we're doing here in Tucson for teaching foundational open science skills where you learn uh, everything about uh, open science skills like containers, uh, Jupyter notebooks, and um, like uh, version control and uh, and so on. So you can find more details about that uh, in the link there. Okay, uh, with that, uh, um, I'm, uh, I'm done with the uh, webinar. So if you have any questions, uh, I'm really happy to answer them. Thank you, Apendra. There are a bunch of questions, so we'll get started on those right away. Okay. Uh, the first question is, um, do we need to write scripts for VICE? Will there be step-by-step -step instructions for those of us who are new to VICE in Jupyter Labs? No, I mean, VICE, uh, so, okay, so the VICE is a uh, Jupyter environment. Uh, so you can, so the VICE is an interactive uh, environment that lets you run Jupyter Notebook or R Studio or Shiny App. So it's like a backend where you run all these things. You can run Jupyter Notebook and R, uh, R Studio and Shiny Apps on your computer too. But the main advantage of uh, running uh, VICE apps in, uh, in Discover environment is we'll take, so it's tightly integrated with the data, data store. So if you want to move the data, then you can do so. And it has shareability, like if you want to share your running analysis, then you can do so quite easily in VICE. And also it's highly secure, so you don't have to worry about uh, uh, of, uh, of your uh, analysis that are running on VICE and so on. So you don't need to write any scripts. However, if you want to uh, run a particular tool in VICE, uh, if, if there's any dependencies, then you need to create a Docker image. And we provided uh, the instructions uh, of how to do that in the VICE documentation. Okay, the next question, will NanoDJ be updated as new versions of Albacore are released or will we need yeah, to? Yeah, yeah, so it's quite easy to update right now because we already have the Docker image for the NanoDJ. So if there's any uh, updates on the NanoDJ, so we just need to pull in the changes and then make it as a separate app. So there is very minimal effort needed to update any uh, versions of the apps in DE, um, uh, including NanoDZ. Okay, is it possible to input data post Albacore reads? 
that is FastQ that we already have? Yeah, yeah, you, you can, you can, uh, you can actually, uh, if you already have FastQ files, then you don't need a base calling step. So you can straight away use the FastQ file and then check the quality of the reads. Uh, and then you, you do a de novo assembly of and calling depending on your research question. And you can, if your data is already on the data store, then you can use the I comments. Or if your data is somewhere like Amazon or Google Cloud, then you can use uh, file transferring tools such as wget or curl or gcloud or whatever it is. Okay, next question, thank you. Uh, what is the biggest size genome that you recommend when using VICE? Oh, we haven't tried uh, NanoDZ with, uh, with lots of genomes. Uh, the only thing that I tried is on the test data set. So, I mean, I would not, uh, I would not recommend using WISE for, um, for doing genome assemblies. Uh, I would recommend WISE to test the subset of your uh, FASTQ files or FASTQ file files, make sure everything works, then use uh, the, the traditional apps such as Kanu, Recon, or Pylon that we have in Discovery environment. And uh, Jovan is gonna show how you can do that uh, in the next webinar. Okay. Do we have access to sample data, small data, to follow all the steps before we start yeah, to yeah, use so, our own data? So if you, yeah, so if, I, so if I go here and then click on this um, get started or quick start, then you can actually see uh, everything that you needed. So if you just use, uh, if you just launched an app, just like what it did, uh, then you should be able to see the test data in the WISE app. You don't have to worry about uh, 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 finding any test data. Okay, last question. Do you recommend using nanopore sequencing for metagenomics-based studies? Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm, uh, I, mean I, I don't have much experience, in, experience using nano de, nan, um, nanopore data because I haven't done uh, much of that, but I have seen people using nanopore, data, nanopore sequencing for doing metagenome because you, sh you have an ability to sequence, uh, you basically you have the ability to assemble full length uh, genomes uh, using nanopore sequencing, which is useful for downstream analysis, uh, such as like uh, variant calling or metagenome and so on. Again, it depends on so many uh, things like what you want to do uh, after you assemble the genome and so on. Uh, for, uh, if you if you just are interested in doing like taxonomy classification, then you don't need to do a full length uh, assembly. Then you can use the, the Illumina to do a 16 as near sequencing, and then do a uh, use like tools such as Chime or Moto to actually functionally classify those uh, uh, samples. Okay, and the last question I'll answer since it has to do with FOSS training. The question is, will FOSS training be available as a webinar or as webinars? And at this time, no, it is not. It is a full two-week person, in-person uh, live training, and it just doesn't lend itself to webinars. Um, the first week is sort of high-level topics where we go through a huge amount of information. And the second week is really hands-on, how to set up your lab with your own customized um, workflows and, and processes using open source tools as well as open science concepts. So that's why it is not going to be available as a webinar. Anyway, if there are no further questions, and I don't think there are, thank you, Appendra, so much. It's been a big day of information and uh, please plan on joining us in two weeks for Jawan's second part of this uh, webinar and uh, thank you we'll see you next two weeks bye everybody thank you. bye everyone thank you so much